factors one can quote, leaving aside the rape or murder, uh, leaving aside the quote, bloody catalog of oppression, which we are too familiar with anyway, what the system does to the subjugated is destroy his sense of reality, Baldwin writes or says. In the case of the American Negro, he says, from the moment you were born, every stick and stone, every face is white. Since you have not yet seen a mirror, you suppose you were white too. It comes as a great shock, he says, around the age of five or six or seven, to discover that the flag to which you have pledged allegiance, along with everybody else, has not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as a great shock to discover that Gary Cooper killing off the Indians, and although you're rooting for Gary Cooper, the Indians are you. This is, of course, Baldwin being Baldwin. William F. Buckley just didn't have a chance. He was overmatched. It comes as a great shock, Baldwin continues, to discover that the country to which you, which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity has not in its whole system of reality evolved any place for you. The disaffection and the gap between people only on the basis of their skins begins there and accelerates throughout your whole lifetime. You realize that you are 30 and you're having a terrible time, he says. You've been through a certain kind of mill. And the most serious effect of it is, again, not the catalog of disaster, the policeman, the taxi driver, the waiters, the landlady, the banks, the insurance companies, the millions of details, 24 hours of every day which spell out to you that you are a worthless human being. It's not that, Baldwin says. But that time, by that time, you have begun to see it happening in your daughter, your son, or your niece, or your nephew. You are 30 by now, and nothing you have done has helped you escape the trap. But what is worse is that nothing you have done, and as far as you can tell, nothing you can do, will save your son or your daughter from having the same disaster and from coming to the same end. The next hero is Nina Simone. It's 1962. Miss Simone sits at a piano for a live recording of Center Man at the Village Gate nightclub in New York City. Moaning in the break, the drum and hand clap driving the beat, each keystroke expresses the urgency of the moment. Simone is slender and striking in a white sleeveless gown. Her features feel pronounced, her gaze focused, sometimes intense, sometimes directed toward the keys, sometimes toward her band or her audience. Her voice, full, deep, a compliment to the series of jangling but precise chords she strums. Oh yeah, she sings. Oh yeah, her voice trailing now, accompanying the chords she plays with an intensity that's directed uh, 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 toward all of us and no one in particular. She begins again, her audience on edge. This time, the pitch is a bit higher. Oh yeah, she sings. Now back to the keys, the sound and tempo build. Miss Simone begins. Oh, Center Man, where are you going to run to? Center Man, where are you going to run to? Where are you going to run to on that day? The song was recorded in 1962. This is three years before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Medgar Evers had not yet been assassinated in the driveway coming home from an NAACP meeting. 14-year-old Addie Mae Collins, 14-year-old Carol Denise McNair, 14-year-old Carol Rosman Robertson, and 16-year-old Cynthia Wesley would not yet be blown to bits by a white supremacist at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. 13-year-old Johnny Robertson and 16-year-old Virgil Ware were not killed on the same day, one by a police officer, and neither one of those boys had yet been lost to history. But Black life was no easier in 1962 than it was in 1963, when more people paid attention. And it was no easier in Birmingham than it had been in Harlem, New York, or Bronzeville in Chicago, or Black Bottom in Detroit. Where will Cinnamon run and hide to escape the judgment that is all around him? He has sinned, which is to say he has amassed a debt. He must repay it. Les Baxter recorded a show tune cover a decade before where Cinnamon runs to the moon. But this is a Negro spiritual, one that has been sung in Black churches since the turn of the 20th century and whose roots run much deeper. It's a song that should be sung with a tambourine. It's a warning and a call to prayer to get right so the church can go home. The philosopher and polemicist Frederick Nietzsche tells us that the origins of guilt 
what he calls bad conscience comes from the material relationship between a lender and a debtor. The debtor, should he pay, fail to pay what he owes, offers the lender his very flesh or the flesh of his wife or the flesh of his child to do with as he will. It's a sign of his free will to offer the one thing over which he has mastery, his body, to repay his debt. And the debt is a real one. The lender takes pleasure in torturing the debtor and at the same time, sears his conscience. The pain he inflicts will never be forgotten and the debtor and all who see his pain will pay their debts from now on. This is not far from a distinctly American theological tradition where a sin sick world with sin sick souls owe debts to their God. In sinning, they've broken a contract and the debt must be repaid. They must pay it with their flesh. This song was sung at the tail end of the long 19th century. The survivors of the lash sang it, and they would continue to sing it through the coming Great Depression. If slavery was punishing, the hunger and disrespect that followed was nearly as bad. Miss Simone's version was like the one our great grandmothers and great aunties sang. It was a song of fire and smoke strummed on bass guitars and well-tuned pianos, but the hand clap was reminiscent of the washboard and her moans of red lines, cotton thorns, and, thumb and slum clearance. The sinner man in this song runs and hides on earth. His punishment comes from this world, not from outer space, like Les Baxter's cover. From the southern horrors Ida B. Wells famously chronicled, and the long trek north and the crack of the police baton in Harlem and Bronzeville and Black Bottom that followed. It is the sting of eviction and unsolved rapes and murders. It is the experience of unemployment and hunger, all while hearing from preachers and politicians and social scientists and do-gooders that move in and out of your neighborhood with their surveys and their cameras and their best intentions in tow, that at the end of the day, it's your fault. It's your refusal to snitch or to keep a man happy or to raise your children or to delay gratification or to shake off the deficits of your culture that put you in this position. It's your social disorganization, as sociologists are fine to say, or your disbelief in the legitimacy of law and law enforcement or the courts. It is your legal cynicism. At the end of the day, it's you. This version was recorded live at the Village Gate nightclub at the corner of Thompson and Bleecker Street in Greenwich Village. The song's protagonist is the sinner man who seeks respite on Judgment Day. The song asks, oh, sinner man, where are you going to run to to avoid judgment on that day? He runs to the rock, to the river, and to the sea to ask for help. And eventually, the sinner man even runs to God saying, please hide me. Please help me, Lord. But the sinner man finds no respite. The river boils. The sea bleeds. The rock says, I ain't going to hide you, guy. And God says, go to the devil. Sinner man, of course, is disappointed. He says to the rock in protest, what's the matter with you, rock? Can't you see I need you, Lord, 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 on that day? But the rock speaks back, saying to the sinner man, I won't hide you. I ain't going to hide you, God. So sinner man runs to the Lord. When the Lord refuses to respond to the sinner man, he says, don't you see me praying? Can't you see I need you? But God responds, where were you when you should have been praying? And he sends sinner man to the devil. Sinner man goes where, where his God sent him and finds the devil was waiting. In this parable, constructed from the traditions of the Southern Black Church, the sinner man knows that the devil will never be satisfied with his torment. That is to say, he knows that no amount of violence inflicted on his body will ever be enough. He cries out, power, power to the Lord, acknowledging what is a matter of fact. The fate of the sinner man is in the hands of his enemy, the devil. Simone's prophetic lyric, like Baldwin's always timely discourses on race and the human condition, better than most capture the social situation of formerly incarcerated people today, who find themselves at the mercy of others, but they rarely find mercy. If we stop for a minute and think about how we think about them, we would admit that we view incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, at least if we view it through the laws and policies we enact, as pathology and dependence and deficiency and laziness and danger and amorality in the flesh. We see, if we pay attention to our laws and policies, so-called criminals as all that are wrong in the world and we treat them this way. For formerly incarcerated people living in the post-civil rights era, there are few if any open doors in the labor market, 
in housing, or even within their families. And just like the sinner man's confession of power when confronted with the power of his adversary, the devil, the admission of legal guilt is brought about through rejection and exclusion, not fact finding, not through deep introspection, but by the power and force and weight of the crime control apparatus that comes down upon them and their families. The river boils, the sea bleeds, the rock and God reject the center man, while social service agencies have waiting lists, affordable housing options are scarce, and employers, landlords, and their family members cast them out, evicting them, or rejecting their applications at every turn. This is in part due to the proliferation, the proliferation of electronic background checks, the advent of what Sarah Lagason has theorized as a kind of, quote, digital punishment, and what Susila Gurasami has described as the carceral web, where Experian alerts don't come through our emails and text messages when there's a data breach, or when our information has been sold to Cambridge Analytica as it was just a few years ago. But we do get alerts on our cell phones when a so-called sex offender moves a few miles away from our home, or when someone on a violent offender registry, if you live in Chicago, moves into your neighborhood. What's worse, the confession of legal guilt does not absolve the sinner from their sin, but it instead brands them, a digital scarlet letter marking the conventional citizen as criminal for life and sentencing them to a kind of punishment for a lifetime. Hence Simone's lyric, the devil is waiting. But to more fully capture what life is like under these conditions, we have to turn away from our impulse to focus on the violence apparent in the archives that we create. Uh, put differently, we must acknowledge the formal mechanisms of exclusion if we wanna know what life is like for the wretched uh, of the earth and to more fully theorize social life in the era of mass supervision. But following Sadia Hartman, we have to try to encounter the wretched in a state of freedom, or at least in the moments of freedom they manage to steal away under the suffocating realities and everyday violence emblematic of what I've come to call the carceral condition. Uh, put it differently, we must map the contours of their increasingly supervised life and note how social and formal legal controls constrain their lives. But if we want to better understand the world that people with criminal records inhabit, and if we want to better understand the informal mechanisms that shape their everyday lives, we have to go outside of jails, prisons, police stations, and courtrooms to see the influence of mass incarceration and its shaping effect outside of the formal crime control apparatus. We must turn away from prisons and courts, the law and the police, if we're to see how laws, police, prisons, and court practices get taken up outside the formal criminal justice system in their everyday lives. That is, we must move beyond and look outside the criminal justice system if we're to grasp its full scale. We must observe how the subjects of crime control make lives for themselves despite the crime control apparatus that they face, if we ever want to fully understand the consequence of crime control in their lives. So to do this, we have to think about the contours, and I think we have to reimagine the problem. So let's start with the contours. You'll remember from a few years ago, President Obama, the first sitting president came to, to do this, came out publicly against mass incarceration, using that term. And mass incarceration, of course, is defined as um, sort of the historic growth of incarceration, where we, we get an increase every year for 27 straight years, beginning in 1972, of the number and rate at which we incarcerate people. And the mass in mass incarceration refer, refers to the targeting of social groups. So much so that poor black men are, 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 can be considered to be arrested uh, in groups. So much so that uh, uh, the target of crime control appears to be groups and not individuals. Uh, so we know this uh, through thinking through racial statistics that I'll talk about in a hot second. He even went as far as to visit a federal penitentiary. This is the first sitting president to do it. Uh, it was filmed by Vice. You know, he did, it was, this is a whole very interesting criminal justice reform campaign effort. Uh, uh, to start reducing things at the federal level, hopefully setting, uh, to, to be quote, smart on crime, hopefully setting a tone for the state uh, and local levels. And we saw a new president who was impeached uh, just, what was that yesterday, right? Like it seems like everything, the, the, the world is, anyway, it feels like last month, but, but he's a new president, impeached again, uh, but we, see, we saw him come out against, uh, 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 also, also taking a position on, on mass incarceration. He never used that language, um, uh, but, 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 but referring to himself as a new law and order uh, uh, president, a new era of law and order. 
and this of course is the world's most famous graph um uh which alludes to the the 27 straight years of growth uh in the number of people held in the american jail or prison and also in the rate at which we imprison so speaking to the groupness the mass in mass incarceration we know that race and mass incarceration uh we know racial disparities in mass incarceration are egregious the black people are twice as likely to be arrested have a five times, five times more likely to be incarcerated for the same crimes serve lengthier sentences uh 10 years uh at the state level uh, i'm sorry 10 percent longer sentences at the state level 20 percent longer sentences at the federal level that they're more likely to serve due to mandatory minimum sentences so that um judges discretion to be lenient when it's not as if judges were lenient with black people it wasn't the case but uh but yet and still the ability to be lenient you know is, is more or less snatched away especially at the federal level and we know that criminal justice contact is disproportionate to things like reported crimes to evidence of crimes when people are stopped we know this from all the stop and frisk studies so 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 whether or not there was actually a crime that happened in an area where a black person was stopped or a brown person but uh, egregiously a black person was stopped um whether or not they had drugs or weapons on them when they were stopped uh uh uh, uh whether or not they had actually committed a crime holding all these things constant uh black and brown people represent something like 80 percent of stops in new york city you know ooh, so we know these from these these stop and frisk studies but the focus on prisons and the police leave a curious yet equally historic phenomena hidden in plain sight the rise of what i've called a supervised society and that what I've written about is mass supervision following European scholars who, who think about uh, who, where there's a formal welfare state, who think about the community sanctions that people encounter, um, has transformed the life worlds of the poor. So we have to rethink the scope of the problem. It's not just a policing and incarceration problem, there's something else going on. So let's put the prison in its place. So this is a bar graph uh, representing 2.3 currently incarcerated, 2.3 2 million people who are currently incarcerated. We know that probation and parole by far uh, uh, it, 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 it's just a by far larger population. The population currently under probation and parole is about twice the size of that, something like 4.7. It, it hovers between, you know, 4.4 and 4.9 or so million people are on probation or parole. Um, and it's been that way since the mid 2000s, um, with the height of mass incarceration, of course, being in 2007. Um, but this figure, if we switch the unit of analysis and change from a point in time count to the number of people who pass through an institution, we know that people who cycle out of jails, in and out of jail. So if we compare this to jail admissions in a given year, for example, something like 11 million jail admissions each year. And that hovers anywhere from 10 and a half million to like 11 and a half million, because some years that, you know, the ebbs and flows over the years, but over the last decade, it's gone anywhere from 10 and a half million to 11 and a half a million people have been processed through a local county jail. Uh, now, if we switch the unit of analysis again, we see that there's an even greater population when we think about the number of people who are currently living, who are estimated to live with a felony record. Um, the felony record does lots of work, and we'll talk about this in relation to housing for sure. 19.6 uh, million people are estimated to have a felony record in the United States. Uh, uh, this figure represents one in three currently living black American men are estimated. So about a third of this population is black, representing something like a third of currently living black American men. And an, an, the last figure that far outpaces both of these are the number of Americans with criminal records. The Bureau of Justice Statistics told us in 2014 that 79 million Americans were estimated to have a criminal record. And there's something striking I like to say here. You know, I'm talking a lot about black and white racial disparities. Um, I don't talk as much about Latinx racial disparities among Latinx folks. I mean, we certainly see this in immigrant detention. My dear friend John Eason does work on immigrant detention centers. And uh, while we know that um, the number of the kinds of people who pass through, well, the, the, the nationalities of people who pass through is undocumented, you know, people come from uh, everywhere, you know, Asia. Uh, you know, African countries, countries, in, you know, in, in sort of the, on the African continent. We know that certainly um, uh, Slavic folks, uh, uh, Eastern European folks and, and Europeans of all kinds, Canadians come through undocumented, all kinds of people come, come through undocumented. Something like 80% of the folks in immigrant detention centers are Latinx people. And so, and so this, 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 is, this is quite egregious. 
<laughs> because it, it's not 80% of the folks are not like the undocumented part, like obviously. Um, okay, but it, you know, something like 20% of, 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 you know, when we think about jail and prison population, something like 20% of that jail and prison population are, are Latinx people, which is, uh, of course, racially disparate. Um, uh, it doesn't, it's, it's not the same kind of disparity that we see, the kind of black white disparity, which is why I don't talk about it as much, but, but it's certainly a disparity there. Um, uh, but when we think about incarcerated populations, the place to look uh, for uh, the kind of systemic racism that, that, that we're laying out here will really be uh, in immigrant detention, uh, which is which is just what 80% of anything tells you you've got a problem. You've got a real problem. Okay. Um, but number of people criminal records, let me say this. If we think that mass incarceration stops at the threshold of the Black family, um, we're absolutely wrong. Uh, we've known since 2016, uh, if following arrest trajectories, we know that while 49% of Black boys will be arrested for a non-traffic violation by the time they turn 23, meaning 49% of people will be arrested for something other than a traffic stop by the time they turn 23. 39% of white boys will be arrested for a non-traffic violation by the time they turn 23. And while we know that 44% of Black women have a currently incarcerated loved one, which is dramatic and striking and incredible, we also know that one in eight white women has a currently incarcerated loved one. Over half of the country has a loved one who's ever been to an American jail or prison. Half the country. So I wanna put this in perspective. There's eight or 900,000 black men that are currently incarcerated representing something like 40% of the American jail and prison system. But white men represent 40% of the American jail and prison system too. They're just undercounted. If we let every black person go today, we still have one of the largest prisons in the world filled with white men. But the way racism works is the conflation of blackness with criminality. And so when we think crime, we think black people. And when we think crime, when we think incarceration, we think crime. Neither one of those things are, are directly linked. <laughs> okay. But what this tells me, when, I'm, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I look at this larger picture, is that we not only have uh, a crisis of incarceration, of arrest, of caging people, but we've erected something like a supervised society where multiple actors manage many people across multiple kinds of institutions, from third party government officials, family and friends who are responding to the, the 80 million Americans with criminal records, to police, courts, guards, court uh, uh, bailiffs and staff that are adjudicating proceedings from misdemeanors that often get dropped and no records show up to felony convictions, uh, which are you know egregious and overwhelming, to, to, to probation and parole officers and, uh, uh, and community correction centers, uh, uh, case managers, social workers, uh, 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 mental health technicians, there's entire workforces that are, that are involved in the supervision of people uh, to, of course, prison guards and, 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 and corrections officers. There's an entire universe, entire workforces uh, uh, employed to manage this large and growing segment of, 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 of our population. And it happens largely under our nose. Communities where the action is. And the prison, despite its place in the public's imagination, is the smallest slice of this vast carceral network that we've erected. So we have to rethink what we talk about when we think about um, repeat offenses, the revolving doors of jail and prison, when we imagine what recidivism is and what it looks like under what circumstances it happens, when we think about crime and punishment in the United States at all, we have to reimagine what this is and, and then I'll argue what it does. I'm taking a little longer than I meant to. And so I'm, I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna st start speeding up a little bit, but, but oh good, what, what, it, what it is and what it does. I wanna point us to, for a hot second to this, this, this hot topic of recidivism. And this is gonna matter a lot 
um, w w when we think about the legal outcomes that people get, which is going to matter a lot for the institutional uh, interactions that they have, the interactions with institutions like housing, like employment, like family, uh, the, the primary institutions that drive social life in our country. You know, um, uh, it's going to matter a lot. But let's think about for a high second, you know, what we talk about when we think about like who's in jail or prison and what recidivism is. So, so on the first hand, when we talk about recidivism and return to jail, the rearrest, uh, which is counted poorly in different places and all of that, but just just holding it, just, just offering a, a definition that might hold it constant. Let's say that recidivism, a good measure of recidivism might look after a year or three, whether or not someone was simply rearrested. If we use that measure, we know whether or not you got rearrested after a certain period of time that recidivism rates are egregious something like half of all people who uh get out of jail or prison are rearrested in the first year that's that's kind of the benchmark is really three years this study by the bureau, bureau of justice statistics carried it out over five years and then did a follow-up study over nine years and over five years when they extended it and said how often how how often are you likely to sort of come back be a rearrested 77% of that population was rearrested. Over nine years, it was well over 80%. It was like 85, 80, some, 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 some large number. I don't have it um, uh, at, at my fingertips right now, and I should have, um, but this is an old slide. But 77% recidivated after five years. We've known this since 2014 when this, when this study dropped. They have 4.9 prior convictions on average. I'll talk to you a little bit about what that does and what that means we, we, we're going to get there. But almost half of the sample had been arrested. It was something like 44% had been arrested 10 times or more during the study period. What does it mean to be arrested 10 times in five years? How do you hold a job? How do you keep a crib? How do you keep a commitment? And what are they arrested for? Well, we know that a quarter of these folks are arrested for, 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 for technical violations of probation and parole. Meaning uh, you, 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 you drank and, and got popped. You might have also smoked some crack, right? Like, but, like, but you failed a drug test or an alcohol test. Uh, 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 you missed an appointment with a probation or parole officer. Uh, you lived, uh, uh, you, 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 you moved and didn't tell your probation or parole officer. Uh, we'll, t we'll talk about this in a hot second. So to understand what's going on here, which I think is a fundamental transformation of the social life of the city, with so many people moving in and through the criminal justice system, and so many people connected to people who have moved in and through the criminal justice system. Remember, one in eight white women has a currently incarcerated, not at some point in life, currently incarcerated. Somebody's in a jail or prison for one in eight white women in our country. Somebody's in a jail or prison for one in two black women in our country that half of our country, half the children in our country has a parent who's been to jail or prison. <laughs> this fundamental transformation, to understand it, we, we, we've got to get close to it. We, we, we've got to use a radical doubt in a persistent proximity. We have to reject the idea that crime and punishment are linked, that race and crime are linked, that, 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 that punishment is a criminological exercise, meaning it is located exclusively in, within and within the criminal justice system, that it does not spread out, that it does not impact others. We have to dismiss that. How could it not if half our kids, uh, 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 if, if so many of our kids have had a parent that's ever been to jail or prison? How can it be? How can it be if, 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 if there's, a, there's a, a website called a, a fo um, a forward uh, FWD, uh, .org, and you can see it's like there's a report that they put out called One and Two, and it follows a, a, a set of literature that's, that's been conducted by Hetty Lee and other sociologists uh, that count the connectedness to, of, to, to, to incarceration, who's connected to the jail or prison in, in which way. So if, 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 if all, this is a giant American problem. So we have to rethink what it is. We have to doubt what they tell us about it, and we have to get close to it. So my question is, what's life like in a supervised society? I've taken way too long to get here, but we're we here now. You know, and, and so my work is is what I call a political ethnography of mass incarceration. I'm very interested in, 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 in the politics at hand, the way power flows. You know, and and, 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 and specifically, if, you know, like there's some formal stuff here that, that makes it a political ethnography. Uh, so, for example, I'm interested in expression 
the expression of law and policy in the lives of people every day. You know, so the, the, the politics of everyday life. And I'm interested in mass incarcerations afterlife. This thing I told you about um, is, is a phrase that I use to understand the ways that it's changed life for us. And then I'll talk to you in a hot second about it. And I conducted this work in Chicago, Detroit, New York, but other cities too. Some places very small, Ypsilanti, Michigan, some places um, uh, much larger, LA, just following people around, different kinds of people, people who are getting out of jail or prison in a given year, people getting out of a detention center. And I don't mean an immigrant detention center, uh, but a police station lockup facility. Uh, uh, and then activists, I followed activists around the country. So just to talk about the apparatus here, this is the national inventory of the collateral consequences of a criminal conviction. And this is a part of the mechanism of spread. And so we know, you know, you all are likely familiar with the collateral consequences, like what these are. Um, but, to, but to offer a definition, these are, these are, these are kinds of legal exclusions um, that are enacted uh, after a conviction that aren't a part of the formal sentence, just to offer a, a kind of operational definition. It's not a part of the formal sentence, but these are certainly legal exclusions. I argue that forms of punishments, but you know, there's a whole like HLA Hart kind of legal theory definition of what punishment is. I think this fits, uh, but we could have a conversation about that. But all politics are local. So, so the, the, national, the, the, collateral, the national inventory tracks something like 45,000 laws and policies. About two or three years ago, there were more. It was like 48,000, but, but 45,000. But all politics are local. If we go to Michigan, um, now this, we're, we're Kent Law School. If we go to Illinois, we see that 1,300 of these joints. These are entries in the legal code that restrict people's access to things. If, but if we go to Michigan, just to, just to keep it on, 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 on task, you know, it, there's 659 unique laws, administrative sanctions, and regulations. This include over 300 that target employment and volunteering. Restrictions from whole swaths of, 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 of whole kinds of employment that you're not eligible to do if you've got a criminal record. And it escalates based on the kind of criminal record with people on the sex offense at the, at the, at the, at the harshest end of the spectrum. There are about 184 uh, entries in, 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 that, that, that limit occupational and professional licensure. So you want to start a business? Yeah, which one? <laughs> which one are you going to start? Right? Like, 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 like which, which license, which professional license you going to get? It, it really matters because there's something called a good character clause in almost all of them. Certainly attorneys uh, have to pass a good character clause. So every time someone with a criminal record tries to go get barred, there's a giant meeting. You might remember this from, from, from coverage of Reginald Dwayne Betts' uh, experience getting barred graduated from Yale and, 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 and there was a whole set of questions because he did a carjacking when he was 16 years old. There was a whole set of questions around whether or not you should quote, let this uh, bar this felon is, 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 he writes a beautiful poetry book called Felon. I don't think he minds being called Felon. He calls himself a felon. Um, uh, but but that's, that was the New York Times headline. 109 limit political and civic participation. So which political positions can you run for? Can you be mayor? Can you be over, over the, the board of water rights and reclamation? Can you be on any of these tax boards uh, 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 that Professor Atuahine is, is, is telling us, you know, have done all this crazy stuff? Yo, I didn't mention this, but can you sit on a jury? You cannot in almost any state. So now here you are, a quote, lawbreaker, a recidivist, a repeat offender, going before a quote, jury of your peers, and none of them have had your experience. None of them know what it means to move around the world with a felony record because they can't, because they're barred automatically. 38 limit access to housing. So much so that um, there are two, there were in the 90s, two federal guidelines. And this, the 90s, 1996 kicked all this stuff off, the, the, the Fair Housing Acts and all this stuff that, you know, a pronouncement by Bill Clinton about, you know, uh, cracking down on. Um, it, it didn't kick all this off. The 80s kicked it off. You read that in my article. But, but, but the, you know, 70s and 80s, you know, like challenge of like the, the, the I don't, you all are lawyers. I'm not. But the, the home is like the, the castle doctrine and like, like all these things, um, like the challenges to that. And, 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 and really that move really made landlords are part of the crime control apparatus. It made landlords, like I, I argue, makes landlords like probation officers because they're not responsible uh, for maintaining a crime-free environment. They're now responsible for reducing crime, for, 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 for reducing, for addressing criminog quote, criminogenic conditions. Um, and this, this doesn't mean that landlords shouldn't be on the hook. It's a really interesting thing. Like you want landlords to be on the hook 
because because you want a habitable apartment, which I'll talk about in a second. But 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 uh, but this is the opposite move. This 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 is this is this is, this is, this is the other move. Where where landlords are now incentivized to 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 discriminate against you because they can be sued uh, if they let you in the building anyway. But 38 limit access to housing rights. I'm on a tangent. Here's the point: there were two federal guidelines in the 1990s, even after Bill Clinton's famous State of the Union address in 1996, where he called on public housing to evict not just the tenants uh, who had criminal records, but the but the people who let people with criminal records visit. Uh, where, 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 where Andrew Cuomo, Governor Andrew Cuomo famously was running HUD and enforced this law and reported on it with glee that evictions went up by 50% in the first six months after the, the inaction of these, of, these, of these new rules and policies. With glee. Andrew Cuomo, the people we all in love with now because he gives a long infomercial about COVID. All right. Anyway. <laughs> so, so there were two guidelines. You can't live in public housing if you are on the sex offense registry. You can't live in public housing if you've been convicted of methamphetamine production. This is the 90s. Those two guidelines were, were interpreted at almost, every, at almost every public housing authority in every city in the country as a broad-based ban on people with criminal records. So much so that the Vera Institute of Justice and a number of other foundations have gotten together to run experiments to measure the recidivism outcomes of people you allow to live in a mama's house if they have a criminal record. So much so that you need an experiment to test whether or not allowing it to happen will improve outcomes. What are the, what are the results? Of course, of course, they improve, improve outcomes because you need a place to stay. All right, I've spent too much time on this. So what does this mean? In most states, you can't hold public office. You, can't, you couldn't groom a dog in Illinois uh, up until a few years ago. Uh, uh, you couldn't become a barber, even if you were trained to be a barber. You may not adopt or foster a child. You may not be in a home with a foster child or an adopted child. You, if depending on, on, like if you're convicted of a crime of violence, which by the way, over half of all prisoners are in prison for a crime of violence. So, so we gotta reckon with violence, like actual violence. I don't mean the kind of violence that happens to happen because of a bad drug deal. I mean, dudes are carrying, dudes are shooting, dudes are engaged in real crime. So right, like real violent acts, we have to reckon with violence. Over half the prison is, are in prison for violent acts or violent crimes, convictions of violent crimes. Many of them dudes are involved in violent acts. You may have, your, have to give up your parental rights. You may not live in public housing. Your job applications may be denied. You may be fired or evicted on a whim. Your relationships are fundamentally different. So I'm going to just explain this. I would usually, because I've taken longer than I wanted to, I would usually uh, you know, read you a story about uh, the life of Jimmy Caldwell. But, but I've been talking so long, I just want to tell you about Jimmy. Jimmy uh, is a man that I met uh, who, who was, who was uh, uh, convicted of uh, grand larceny and, and a, a series of other crimes. He's been in and out of jail and prison for you know, many years of his life, all for like property crimes, all for stealing, basically. Um, stealing, trespassing, you know, this kind of thing. Turns out Jimmy had bipolar disorder. Jimmy gets to prison. The, the prison, the, 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 the mental health technician tells Jimmy that he doesn't have a, a, a mental health problem. He has a drug problem, which he did. He was also on crack, uh, but he has a drug problem. Takes him off his psychotropic medication. A mental health technician. This is the part of the argument that I make in Carceral Citizen, like the article you all read in Carceral Citizenship, that the formal rights that you have get suspended. Um, if, if we think about the, the article with Amanda Alexander, I don't know which one I sent you to read, but if you read the one with Amanda Alexander, there's a discussion on penological interests. Um, that allow wardens, for example, to suspend the rights of prisoners. Um, uh, there, there's a legal argument around penological interests that you all could dig into much better than I could. Um, uh, but, but, but either way it goes, you don't have the same sort of formal rights uh, uh, that are enforced in the same kind of way. Anyway, so he's taken off that. Of course he's got, so he comes out, I meet him after eight years, and of course he's got bipolar disorder and some other problems. So just to tell you a little bit about Jimmy, Jimmy uh, is, is homeless. Jimmy uh, is living in a in a in a building that his former dope dealer uh, uh, owns. H him and his former dope dealer become very close in the book. There's a chapter on them um, and, and, and their relationship. And he lets them sleep in houses that he that that he that he's rehabbing. Well, anyway, um, long story short, Jimmy's told to do a bunch of stuff. He's handed a sheet of paper called his conditions of release. 
So Jimmy, who's sleeping in an abandoned building, who has no money to get around, no money for transportation, also has to make his way to a workforce development agency. He has to apply for jobs. He has to do workforce development training, which is, which is you know, uh, the, uh, an intervention that helps Jimmy get ready for the worlds of work. It teaches him how to tie ties and write resumes. Uh, he has to go to substance abuse treatment. Uh, uh, he has to do all this stuff before uh, a certain time in the afternoon because he has a because he has a, a curfew i think it's before three o'clock in the afternoon um and 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 he has to report to his probation or parole officer um once a week and also attend mental health tra training because he because uh his probation officer is is uh, astute and figures out that he really has these mood swings and he needs to see somebody he gets put back on his medication you must check in so i meet jimmy at the rosa parks transit center in downtown detroit and we're gonna jump on, we're in close to Midtown, and we're gonna jump on the, the bus and make our way to his first appointment. Now, without me, he doesn't have a bus card. I hand out bus cards uh, at the end of each of the interviews that we do, and for and for dollar gift card. And without me, uh, he also doesn't have uh, a cell phone because he's run out of minutes on his old cell phone. He was, he was hoping that the $40 gift card that I would hand him as a part of our interview protocol would, would be useful for him to, turn his minutes back on. So we get off the bus. Detroit has a notoriously uh, slow uh, bus system. Mike Duggan talked about it uh, in, in his first state of the city kind of speech. He talked about the bus system and the, how he passed a couple in the snow. And two hours later, he drove back by and they were still standing out in the snow uh, because the bus had not yet come. So, so I'm meeting Jimmy on this notoriously unreliable bus system. Uh, 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 and we're going to go to the to the workforce development office. So we walk. We walk at first because it's just a mile from the place where I met him at the bus depot. And we walk about a mile, and it takes about 20 minutes, and it's freezing cold. It's February, and the whole time Jimmy is telling me, I'm glad to be doing something positive. I'm glad to be spending time with a, quote, brother like you, you know, all these kinds of things trying to make me feel comfortable. And I really feel uneasy. I'm like, yo, what's this guy on? You know, I, this dude is like, why is he talking to me? Like, let's just get to the bus. Let's get where we're going. You know, shut up, man. Like, you know, it's enough, enough is enough. I'm good. Like, like the first thank you is enough. I, and why are you thanking me? You know, like you're about to spend two hours with me and I'm giving you $40 for it. Like, like, like this is enough. We get to the bus depot and I realize why he's being so nice to me. He's being so nice to me because I, my argument is because he can't know who he's going to need from moment to moment. We get to the bus depot not the bus depot, the, the uh, workforce development center that we were on our way to, this prologue said he must go to and check in and take these classes and all these things. And not only is the, but, is, is, is the, is the workforce development office closed, the building itself is closed down. There are no lights on in the entire building, this large gray stone monstrosity uh, about a mile from the bus depot where we walked. There's a loose leaf sheet of paper, scotch taped on the front on the outside of the of the of the of the building in the middle of the winter that tells us which sites might be open the workforce development site that happens to maybe be open is nine miles from where we are uh at that moment which means we'd have to walk back to the bus depot and then and wait on a bus and then get on the bus and it's February and it's cold and Jimmy is underdressed. He's got a thin baseball jacket on, a thin worn skull cap. He doesn't, I give him my gloves, you know, um, uh, and I'm cold. You can see your breath. You know, it's, it's one of these days, you know, it's, it's freezing. It's February in Detroit. Detroit gets cold. So we walk, we walk, so we have to walk back to the bus. And it turns out that the, that the, the center, not the one he was sent to, but the one that might be open is just a little ways from from the place where he's sleeping at night this 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 kind of uh rehab this, this house that he that's in the middle of a rehab that he's helping to gut that his dope dealer lets him stay at so here we are about to walk over there now about to take the bus over there will we get there before three o'clock probably not uh uh will we get there at all given given <laughs> who knows uh and i'm cold and I see Jimmy's a, a nice guy in a bad situation. So I'm like, Jimmy, come on, jump in my car. I'm going to give you a ride. Now, it wasn't my research protocol to let people like ride around. I was trying to figure out how people got around on their own. 
And so scientifically, you know, I, 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 I suppose I'm breaking some research protocols. I, you know, I, I want to know how does Jimmy get around and, and me getting Jimmy around is not knowing how he gets around. But anyway, so we hop in the car, give him a ride. He's thanking me the whole car ride. I was annoyed when he was thanking me on the walkover. I'm more annoyed now, uh, but it doesn't matter what we're, we're driving there. We get to the workforce development shop that's around his house. It's closed. It's, it's not closed. I'm sorry. It has a waiting list and the waiting list is full. Jimmy can't get services even when we get there. So all this has to be explained to a probation officer. Jimmy can't sign up for classes. Uh, they don't give out resources for people who aren't able to sign up for the classes. You know, this whole sort of run around. All this has to be explained to a probation officer if Jimmy wants to stay out of jail or prison. Uh, the probation officer has to believe Jimmy. It, it sounds like a highly unlikely story, the kind of story that people tell you when they're asking you for money, you know? And Jimmy wouldn't have even made it to the second center had I not given him a ride, given the notoriously unreliable bus transportation system, given his curfew, et cetera, et cetera. I gave Jimmy a ride because he was a nice guy uh, in a hard situation. Or at least that's what I tell people when I tell the story. If I was being honest with you, I would tell you that I gave Jimmy a ride because I was cold and I didn't feel like getting on the bus and spending another hour and a half in the Detroit winter following Jimmy anywhere. Jimmy got a ride to the next site on my whim because I felt like it. And this is why Jimmy was buttering me up. If he didn't make it to his appointment, he would have violated his parole. He could be sent back to jail or prison. And everybody's clear on this because 25% of all prison admissions in a given year are for probation and parole violations just like this. So what does this do? What does this mean? This means that third parties, employers, landlords, criminal justice actors and agents, licensing bodies and governing officials, families, social service providers, almost everyone else that people with criminal records come into contact with have enormous power over their lives. On my whim, he makes it to an appointment or not. On my whim, he stays out of jail or prison or not. On a grandmother's whim, he has a place to stay or not. On a girlfriend's whim, he has a place to live or not. How do you get an argument? with a girlfriend in a situation like that. This is because helping is risky. In the article you read about interpretation of liability laws, and we know that families now face eviction, that good landlords, you know, if they, if they house people, you know, so it makes it hard for people uh, uh, to help people with criminal records. So, so I'm the grandmother, Jimmy needs a place to stay. The probation or parole officer decides that the place that he lives in isn't really uh, is it, is it, you know, doesn't pass muster for a proper parole placement. It doesn't have a phone. The conditions aren't really habitable. There are known offenders on the block. You know, whatever, whatever the reason is, Jimmy now needs a place to stay. No place to stay is a violation of your probation or parole. You have to have an address to parole from. You can go back to jail or prison if you don't have it. He now has to stay with me. I'm the well-meaning grandmother. But if I let Jimmy stay in my place, I can be evicted. And I'm clear that I can be evicted. So there's this pressure on my end to not help Jimmy. Interpretation of liability law uh, since the 1980s makes helping risky. Families face addiction. There's also the informal stuff like the fatigue of parents, partners, and children to care for able-bodied people uh, uh, who, who are locked out of the labor market. And of course, employees, landlords, social service agencies are made responsible for their actions. This is the discussion that we had earlier about these, these changes where landlords can be sued, uh, 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 social service agents can face uh, lawsuits, or they could lose their licensure, they could lose insurance, et cetera. And of course, it's not in my backyard, but the stakes are even higher for people with criminal records. And here's the point, legal exclusion makes them at once dependent on others like me and undesirable candidates for help at the same time. This is a largely unaccounted for vulnerability where an argument with a partner could be about with street homelessness, a problem with a coworker could equal the loss of a scarce work opportunity, a missed appointment or pissing hot, you know, smoking weed, say in a place where weed is legal, uh, could mean a trip back to prison. A misunderstanding with a case manager, a social worker could mean a loss of everything. Jimmy lives in a kind of economy of favors. The nature of everyday life and everyday interactions are fundamentally transformed. Where because of the legal, the power, because of legal exclusion, people like me now have enormous power over the lives of Jimmy. 
So the relationships start at a place of asymmetry where Jimmy doesn't know what he may need from me. But if I withhold it, or if someone in my position withholds it, he may go back to jail or prison. So he has to act in such a way that puts me at ease, that makes me comfortable with him so that I'll let him sleep on my couch, give him a ride, you know, give him the money to, to, to pay the bus card off, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll finish here. I want to not tell you a story. I want to explain. I usually read this, but I just want to explain. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the three most important women in Jimmy's life. Uh, Ruth, his mother, Tabitha, his sister, and Cynthia, uh, his girlfriend. He met Cynthia while he was in prison, and she was with him during the entire prison stay. Um, and uh, when he got out, Jimmy told me, look, man, I'm in my mid-40s. Um, Tabitha's in her mid-60s. Uh, I want me a hot girl. He tells me he's ready to end the relationship with Tabitha. No, I'm sorry, with Cynthia. Tabitha, his sister, uh, knows that Jimmy uh, has had drug problems, but more importantly, knows that Ruth, his mother, used to let him stay with her when he was in and out of jail or prison, but that Ruth's landlord has now told Ruth that if she lets him stay one more time, that he's going to put her out. And so Tabitha sees that the mother will be put out if she lets Jimmy stay at her house. And, and, and she not only teases Jimmy, but, 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 but she, 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 she mistreats him. Uh, their birthday parties, uh, she keeps the kids' toys in a car, and she tells people that Jimmy's a crackhead and he'll steal all the toys. Uh, he, 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 she talks about what a man he's not um, because he puts their mother at risk. Now, Cynthia, the partner who he doesn't want to stay with, uh, who wants to get out of the relationship with, uh, allows him to sleep at her house. So I catch up with Jimmy say six months after the last time I talked to him. And he's been sleeping over at Cynthia's uh, for quite a while now, away from Tabitha who hounds him. Um, uh, and he's trying to conscientiously avoid Ruth because he knows when, when, when Ruth sees him, Ruth wants to help him. And he knows that his mother's gonna help him. And so he told me he didn't wanna put her in the position uh, uh, where he would have to, where she would wanna help him and he'd have to tell her no. So he avoids the person he knows will help him because she wants him to, because if she helps him, she's going to lose her place. But he's been sleeping at Cynthia's house. And months before, he told me he wanted a hot girl. He wanted to leave her. So I asked him, yo, what's up with Cynthia? And he says that he decided that they were going to get married. I said, why? What happened? Well, it turns out Cynthia's had a stroke over this time, which is awful. And she lives in what? Um, he called a convalescent home. And uh, Jimmy was trying to figure out how they could get married so that he could get an apartment together in their name and take care of her. He told me that uh, she stuck with me in prison. It's only fair that I stick with her now. Now, whether Jimmy's telling the truth, whether he's got this you know, larger than life sense of moral obligation, uh, toward this woman he's not attracted to. Uh, you know, he wasn't attracted to her when he got out of prison. She was too old for him. He said he wanted a hot girl. She's likely less attractive now, uh, uh, you know, recovering from a stroke in a, in, a, in a nursing home. Or, so whether it's this sense of moral obligation or whether it's the fact that he had been spending nights at our house away from the, the rehabbed homes that he was staying in, the, the gutted houses that he was staying in, drafty and wet, uh, 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 full of debris, uh, with no heat, <laughs> you know, in a, in a, in a, in a Detroit winter uh, that his old dope dealer owned. So whether it was because he needed a place to stay or whether it was because of some sense of obligation, when I asked Jimmy if the nature of his relationships with the three uh, uh, people in his life would have been different had he never gone to prison, he told me simply yes. He stayed with Cynthia because he owed her a debt. He stayed away from his mother because his criminal record would get her evicted. And his relationship with his sister Tabitha is contentious because his record threatens the well being of his family members, or at least that's how he interpreted it. He lives in an economy of favors. This thing alters the nature of social life in the American city, creating power imbalances. 
It shapes even the most intimate of social relations. How does Jimmy leave Cynthia? Where does he stay if he does? The law gets in between us. These 45,000 get in between us. If we look from above, we might see mass incarceration. We'd be focused on things like jail and prison expansion, voting rights, employment outcomes, recidivism, the day's political wins, as in whether or not Joe Biden is too much of a, a haggard old, you know, sort of crime control reformer uh, uh, who's interested in, you know, reinventing tough on crime. If, he ha if, if Kamala Harris has the kind of moral imagination we need for this new era of criminal justice reform, if, 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 if. If Trump or Sessions managed to stage a successful coup and stayed in power, what kinds of crime control might they have enacted? Like we might be concerned with the, sh the, the day's political wins. But if we look from below, we would think about the fundamental transformation of social life that we see in altering of the social life of the, of, of, of the city. And we might see the emergence of what I'm calling an economy of favors. This is a new kind of citizenship of which you read for the reasons that you read about. It's not simply second class citizenship for the reasons I've articulated in the paper that you read. And it's certainly not a matter of behavior. So this isn't something that you could treat your way out of. This isn't like some sort of rehabilitation effort for Jimmy. In fact, we've targeted Jimmy with all of our interventions. We've taught him to be a, a good financial money, a good financial manager. You know, we've taught him how to how to tie a tie and write resumes to prepare him for the workplace. Um, we've taught him how to how to think for a change. That's the title of a program, a cognitive behavioral therapy program that's popular in prisons, thinking for a change so that he can stop and think before he's about to commit a crime. So we've done all this, this psychological interior work and none of that addresses the fact that Jimmy has no place to live. None of that addresses the fact that without Cynthia, he's, he's gonna sleep in a, in, a, in a basically an abandoned building that he's rehabbing for his old dope dealer. None of this changes the fact that there's not a landlord in Detroit that has a legal obligation uh, uh, to rent to him, or put differently, that he has any legal recourse when he's discriminated against in the labor market because of his criminal record. So how do we get free? I think we intervene at the level of citizenship, that we advocate for law and policy change that reimagines justice itself. And remember communities where the action is, that we train our eyes, not just at the rising prison populations or even at police interactions, though this is very important, right? Like, the, the, like what police do, the fact that they murder black people every day and not just black people, poor people throughout this country get murdered by police. Many, many poor whites, many more poor Native Americans, indigenous Americans are murdered at a much higher rate even than black people uh, in this country. But we don't talk about that one bit at all. Uh, so, you know, police murder is a thing that we need to solve. I'm not saying that we don't. Um, but we have to also remember that communities where the action is, communities where the murder happens. And that murder shapes social life. It shapes how we understand and interact with the important institutions of our lives. It changes and challenges our health and public health and mental health. It, 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 it con we're constrained uh, in interesting ways. And we have to promote laws that promote the intrinsic humanity of people with records. You know, I've argued in different places that we might want to think about people with criminal records as, as members of a protected class. If, if, if we did that, if we, if we treated the criminal record as if it were a racial category or as if it were a gender category, um, how, might we, how might we think about the ways that they move in and through society? So I think we live in strange and marvelous times. If we were to set every prisoner free today, we'd still live in a supervised society because of the reasons that I think I've laid out today. I've tried to ask different kinds of questions, different theoretical questions, tried to move outside the discourse of power to think about like what citizenship is, not taking it for granted, for example, and saying, yo, okay, like, so what is this thing that people are experiencing? And, and how do we understand it? And I tried to attend to different empirical questions to move us beyond the archives, the limits of our imagination. But the question before us is really an ethical one. We might live in a supervised society, but the question for us is really what kind of society we wanna live in.